You're listening to Sacks in the Basement, a production of the Broadcast Basement Limited, where every show is 30 minutes of good and comes from a basement bar on the south side of Chicago. Pull up a stool, pour a cold one, and join us right now for Sacks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SacksInTheBasement.com. Socks in the basement at Cork and Carey at the park on a beautiful Friday night. Uh, the White Sox are getting their asses kicked. Well, yeah, huh? that didn't take very long. I mean, I, I think Ian Happ hit a home run first, like, changing, a one and two pitch, so fourth pitch of the game. Changing managers didn't make any difference. Derek Crochet needed Pedro Grafal. Or maybe Charlie Montoya. We didn't know what it was. We don't know what it is. Somewhere, Garrett Crochet is waiting for Pedro to come back to him. That was a terrible start. <laughs> but you know what? We, we're we sitting here at 33rd in Princeton, shadow of the ballpark. It's a beautiful night. There, There's people out here. What I find amazing is that as a fan who gets into the ballpark, I have never noticed that there are people that are still trying to get in the third and fourth inning. Oh, I yeah. Saw, I, saw, I saw a family in a car do non-White Sox parking for $40 in the fourth inning of this game. Oh, my gosh. And pull their car in so they could start walking up shields to the ballpark. And I was like, why? You're down 7 nothing in Those milkshakes aren't going to campfire themselves, Christopher. It's better I, at the ballpark. I'm amazed by it. Like, in the third inning, I took a picture. I put it up on social media. Yeah. It was wall-to-wall traffic right outside of here, and they were already down 7 nothing. Yeah, I, in, you, in, you and in I were sitting in Cork and Carry. You and I are sitting in Cork and Carry. I'm having an award-winning burger. You're you're having all oh, sorts. You had everything off the I menu. I ate like a 20-year-old. Yeah, you did. I, I did. I was laughing. So I had... I, I had, I've got gas for you. I, so. I had two buffalo chicken egg rolls, one Irish egg roll, and cheese curds I, the fact to go that you with had my one, green line on tap. Yeah, you had yeah. one Irish egg roll, which tripped me up a little bit. I, well, I needed something. To, I needed something to kill the heat. I understand. The, when I was making the order, there was a logic to it. I understand. Yeah, we're coming off of three hours of entertainment here. I don't know. I use entertainment loosely. Well, myself, <laughs> my sock summer, and Cherise E from the 108, and then Angie Taylor was here with uh, with uh, Rock 95.5. Yeah, I mean that was. Yeah, I'm going to tell you something right now. She's wonderful. If you were here yes. at the event, uh, you got to watch Angie Taylor th- like challenge me to an actual fist fight. And you would have enjoyed that, right? I would wrestle with Angie Taylor. <laughs> I would. I'm not going to lie. I would wrestle with Angie Taylor. Okay? The way what, she, what's your finishing move on Angie Taylor? I, 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 I'm not even getting into it. This is a PG show. But <laughs> it, was, it was a lot of fun. They were really gracious. I mean, I, I'm going to tell you this honestly. As somebody who's doing a podcast who used to do radio and used to do rock radio, I would have been meaner to the podcast than she was. Oh, yeah, you would have. Right? I'd have been like, you Back guys. Back in the are, day. Oh, yeah. yeah. 20 years ago, I'd have been like, who are these jokers? Yeah. She was so gracious. They were all so nice. They got, when it was time for us to start, they got out of the way. We announced their Metallica tickets and, and then they did their winners. It worked seamlessly for people that had not met each other until tonight. I mean, it worked uh, it out really well. Hope for the human race, the way that we got along. This is with Rock this is what we're doing at this point. The White Sox season is so completely lost that all we can do is heal all of humanity by yeah. you and Angie Taylor getting along. Yeah. So, so, so podcasters and radio stations coming together, and Garrett Crochet is apparently terrible Bobby, without Pedro Grafal doing terribly. So, as we're in the calm before the storm, because you know this place is going to be live in an hour and a half. Oh yeah, this game it may be sooner. It becomes a blowout. They might be all over at the sixth inning getting bombed right. at Cork and Carey. Right. Oh, we're going to try except, to get a show. Except for the people that are still parking and going into the park at this point. All right. So let, let's talk about the big news because everybody wants to hear what we have to say. Yeah. Pedro gets fired. Good job, Chris Getz, waiting until he screws up the losing streak. I mean, it, it's you and I talked about how White Sox it is. To get on the precipice of baseball immortality, yeah. as bad as the immortality would have been, and screwed up by losing to the A's. I was lucky enough to be on CBS News. You were. Uh, the day yeah. it happened. They reached out to me and they said, would you come on? I was on local news and they got a reaction from me. And, you know, I'll say the same thing I said on the newscast if you missed it. This team was going to be bad no matter what. But but Pedro made it worse. Ricky Renteria, I had to look this up, and I, I said this in a quote that didn't get used in the newscast. Ricky Renteria in the three main years of the rebuild, when they were bad, 
came in fourth place, fourth place, and third place. Never had a a record lower than 380 win percentage. Two of them, he was above 400. Pedro is historically bad. This right. team was not going to win anything this year, but Pedro Grafal somehow made it worse than expected and had to go. But my other point that I made, which I think was watered down the newscast, is that it's it, it's not it's not going to get fixed with a new manager. No, it's going to get no, fixed no, no, no. when Jerry Reinsdorf isn't here anymore, and and it all starts up at the top. And that was the phrase I used. Like I think during the interview, I mentioned Jerry Reinsdorf twenty five times, and you and I both noticed because we both went to you know journalism school, and we both right. long time ago when we didn't have gray in our in our facial hair and our, in our regular hair and everywhere else like we many many pounds many and moves many ago. pounds ago yes. when we were doing this when we could eat nothing but egg rolls for dinner and feel okay i understood that if i interviewed f- somebody for 10 minutes it was going to be a 17 second clip i was going to take what i needed exactly yeah it's always it's always a sound bite and i knew that's what was going to happen yeah but i found it interesting that in that report on cbs news and again very gracious I love them for doing it. They interviewed the guy who's the owner at Grandstand Sports. They interviewed a fan that was outside the place. They interviewed me, and they interviewed a guy from Sax Machine. They had all these people, and I think all of them mentioned Jerry Reinsdorf. But all their quotes were, it starts at the top. It felt like he's Voldemort. Like Chicago media won't mention him by name. I said his name 17 times in that 10 minutes. They found the one clip where I said it starts at the top, so it was vague. And and that's that was striking to me when I saw the news report. Like, I mean, Dad's sitting there, and he's watching the thing. He had a TiVo it for me. TiVo it? I had something going on. He calls it TiVo. It's just okay. what everybody else uses. But he calls it TiVo. And he goes, I TiVo'd it for you. And I go, you what? <laughs> Does that still exist? I don't know if TiVo exists, but the, the, the right. idea of Then it, his yeah. grandchildren had to help him like rewind back to watch the report because I hadn't seen what they used. We got to the end of it, and my mother's like, oh, you were great, Christopher. And I'm like, thank well, of you. Of course. Man. Of course I, you, I was. You could have thrown up on camera and, and she would have said you were Dad great. Dad looks at me and he goes, man, they will just not let you say Jerry Wright's right, no. name on television, will not they? Not at all. I mean, he, he owns a media company. He literally owns, he's the majority owner of NBC Sports. If you're in the media in Chicago, you don't want to make him upset. I think even if it's not a mandate, it's a cringe thing. You're going to pick the quote that doesn't mention him for your news report, no matter how many times I said his name. Because in the end, it's not Pedro, it's Jerry. But listen to how often people are afraid to say his name. Well, you know, and and it's gotten to a point, though, where in Nashville, where he wants to move the team, apparently, if you say his name three times in a mirror... He shows up with J.B. Pritzker in handcuffs, <laughs> demanding $2 billion in a new stadium. So at least here, it's just a question of whether or not, you know, you get blacklisted from ever talking about the White Sox again. What did you think when it comes down and when they, when they announce the thing? I was like, well, this is what I expected. I, I, yeah. I wanted to believe they were going to do it. There was that cynical part of me that didn't believe they were going to get rid of Pedro. But when it happened, I was like, okay, that makes sense. And what I thought was really funny is you and I said in spring training, why is Grady Sizemore major league coach? He doesn't have a role. I think Chris Getz already knows who gets the team the moment he fires this joker that he was saddled with. It was it was absolutely apparent because and, – and they're now reporting it that, that here's a guy, Grady Sizemore, goes to the Arizona Diamondbacks. Josh Barfield is there. When, when before he joins the White Sox, and Barfield's the one who has him interning in the front office, and identifies him to Chris Getz as a guy that probably has the intelligence, the baseball IQ, the charisma, and all the things that you need to be a successful manager. The shame of it is, is that Grady Sizemore is not going to get a real shake here because this team is not going to give him any opportunity to show what a good manager can do even oh, with this I, roster I don't think he, why would he be a good manager though i mean what has he done and, 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 and there's and there's no reason why he should be good but he's getting an opportunity now which good for grady sizemore nice of josh barfield to do it this is why he was here but this is also i think proof that gets knew that this season was doomed from the get-go because he almost immediately what did he do he goes no the next manager is going to be from the outside so sizemore can't possibly keep this job not to mention the fact that there's no there's no prayer 
that he's going to get enough done or show enough that as a guy who's never managed before, that he can do it. And the last time we did this as White Sox, it was Robin Ventura, and we remember that that went mediocrely. But Robin looked older. Grady looks like he could go out and play right now. Did you I, see him I in the like dugout? Grady in I right mean, field right Grady now. looks like right now he's the same age as everybody else out there. He, he looks he does. like he's 25 years old. He does. Robin was aged, very, yeah. very aged when he showed up. Grady looks like a kid that they just gave the team to. And I, I'm, I'm. Here's the thing. I want him to succeed. I want him to do better than Pedro. I want what I believe was going to happen. A new voice wakes up Luis Robert Jr. Yes. I want that. Now I'm interested in the last couple of months. I am. Oh, I am too. I want to see who plays. I noticed that Gavin Sheets is a first baseman. That made sense. Gavin Sheets is a first baseman. Grady Sizemore knew it. You know, here's the thing. Chris Getz says in one of his first times that he speaks after getting rid of Pedro that he wanted to learn who Pedro was. He really didn't work with him very much in that first year because he wasn't in charge. He distances himself, just like Pedro doesn't thank him. He thanks everybody. He thanks Kenny and Rick Hahn and Jerry and Tony and the ticket window girl and everybody else. But he doesn't right. thank Chris Getz. And Chris Getz goes, I didn't know that much about him. And very early on, I saw a difference in philosophy. And now here's Grady who's got all these minor league managers and guys with more experience around him. And I guarantee you, it's like Billy Bean in Moneyball, the movie. Not the late Billy Bean, God rest his soul. You know, Not what he did in real life with the A's, but the fictionalized version. But it's version. the Brad Pitt, Billy Bean, who goes, you're going to play this guy here, you're going to play this guy here, you're going to do this, right. you don't want to hear it again. And that's what's happening in Grady Sizemore today, put out Chris Getz's lineup. And guess who's not an outfielder? Gavin, Gavin Sheets, Sheets is not an outfielder. And one of the first things that happens is Dominic Fletcher, a real outfielder, uh, almost picks off Pete Crow Armstrong, rounding first base, and Gavin Sheets, as a first baseman, actually gets the guy out. And then, of course, because it's the White Sox at this point, they somehow get a hometown call against them in their own home park. Yeah. And the and the umps rule that that Crow Armstrong is safe. And he was definitely out. And he was he was very by much out. Yeah. He was out by a mile. Uh, Sox in the basement, listeners. Uh, those of you watching this on YouTube, we're going to put this out. We are, are actually shooting video. Uh, I don't think I mentioned that yet. We're shooting video. It'll be on the YouTube channel on Monday. Uh, the podcast out, of course, on a Saturday. Uh, get over to Window and Door Superstore of Oak Forest. Uh, they've been doing it for 40 years out there the right way. They don't show up inside of your house. They're not putting their feet up on your on your ottoman. They're, they're not uh, they're not petting your dog. You know, they're not they're not saying where's the where's the bathroom at? I'm going to need 20 minutes, and then I'm going to show I, you I'm an example. I'm fixing to blow window. this up before I show you a window. Yeah. I had somebody over at the house the other day for an appointment. And the first thing they did is they asked if he used the bathroom, and they were in there for 20 minutes. A stranger in my bathroom for 20 minutes. For 20 minutes. In my That's bathroom. not a good sign. It's not a good sign. No, you won't get that with Window and Door Superstore of Oak Forest. Uh, you go to them. Go in the showroom. Everything's full right there in front of you. All the doorknobs, all the windows. Every setup is there. The etchings in the windows. See it in person. Speak to an owner in the showroom. There's going to be an owner on site. Their own installers there to do the work. They've been doing it that way for 40 years. 6280, 159th Street in Oak Forest. See more at windowdooroakforest.com. I love the fact that you're looking at the actual read. And I did that from memory, Ed. Memory. That's right. <laughs> it's the difference between Grady Sizemore and Ricky Renteria. Ricky would have been great to bring Ricky, back. Ricky, honestly. You I would have taken Ricky back in a heartbeat. You, we were too mean to Ricky Renteria, but I don't ever thought, I don't, I don't ever think I was mean to him. I think I always said, he's just not the guy that wins it for you. Right. But he's perfect for development. And, 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 and that, was, that was the thing. And Ricky Renteria, if you think back, even when he was the Cubs manager, that was kind of the knock on him is, is that Ricky's a guy that is going to get to these young guys, teach them how to play professional baseball. Uh, he's going to and, – and we we would get upset with Ricky over his lineup choices, right? But if you think about it from a developmental standpoint, moving young guys up and down the lineup makes sense. What Pedro did was give Nicky Lopez too much play, right? Well, he's out there tonight. I know. Oh, got and, and, and look, and, and here's the thing. Nicky Lopez is still going to be – he's a player on the team. Grady Sizemore is still going to play him. But I think, you know, if Grady Sizemore follows along with what Renteria did, you will see Dominic Fletcher or Brooks Baldwin get some run as a leadoff hitter, even though they're not hitting well, right? You're going to see guys move up and down who are younger. Naperville Nicky, the problem was is that Pedro, and you and I have talked about this, Pedro would use Nicky Lopez as though this was prime Tim Anderson 
that you have to give the benefit of the doubt. Or this is Ozzie Smith, who you don't care about his bat. You just want him in the lineup, and you, and you might bat him leadoff, or you might bat him ninth, or you might move him around the lineup based on you know, what the matchups are, but you know he's going to be in there. He's Nicky Lopez. He's, he's a veteran who is not going to be the long-term answer for anything. So the question is, is going to be, will Chris Getz give Sizemore a Renteria-like lineup where he's going to be experimenting with guys that are going to potentially be part of the future? And that could include Gavin Sheets and Andrew Vaughn. That could include, you know, guys that they still haven't brought up. Who knows? I want to see I wanna, Oscar Colas. I want to see certain guys get at bats. Miguel Miguel Vargas has to get at bats. He's got to get at bats every okay. day now. You got uh, you got to prove that that trade. You got to get Dominic something. Fletcher out there and see what he is. You got to see what Corey Jokes is. I think that Absolutely. he didn't get enough of a chance to see what he is. I want to see Oscar Colas and a little bit of an inside thing here. So we did this event tonight, and we have Rock ninety five five there, and we've got from the one hundred eight, we've got us, we've got other people that showed up. People walked in who may have rumors from the team, may know something about the team. May have more, more there was, access than There was a lot of you and chatter, have. and yes. nobody wants to say it because they're like, well, I'm not sure if it's true. But when there's smoke, there's fire. I don't think Oscar Colas is coming up. Supposedly he's hurt, but also supposedly there's, some, there's something that didn't click right between him and the team. I don't know if we're ever going to see him again. Now, that was the buzz in the room. It could just be the injury. I would have liked to have seen him one time. It always felt like Pedro didn't like him. So you wonder, was it Pedro or something else? Because it seems like he's got an awful lot of talent, but it never panned out in the major leagues, and I don't know if we're ever going to see the guy again. Which, if you're going to bring the guy up, let's say he is a... um, There's problems there, okay, that that are not his injuries, that are not his phenomenally high strikeout rate that there are problems with Oscar Colas as a member of the White Sox this is an opportunity to show that he can play at the major league level in a, in a time period where it doesn't matter because all you're looking to do is build up his value because you, you want to be able to then flip him for something if he's not part of your plans either you're writing him off and you're just going to lose him or you flip him and that's and that's going to be start to have to be the conversation about everybody like Garrett Crochet you know we talked about leading up to the deadline is he somebody that's going to have more value in the offseason and of course he will and uh, not if he does this but not if he does this no. all yeah but that, that's, that goes back to the idea of they've overpitched him they wanted to trade him clearly they wanted to right. match his value now it's time to shut him down a little bit or pitch him every eight days. Get him on the the Grayson Rodriguez plan. There must have been a home run. I got fireworks in the we background. Got fireworks. Here. Okay. Unless they're shooting him off for the Cubs at this point because they don't care. I mean, like, they must have scored a run at this point because you can hear him here from the cork. Honestly, this could have been a double. <laughs> We're doing double fireworks. Yeah, now. yeah extra base hits are worth it's fireworks. A double. It's a double. Yeah. Shoot off the fireworks. Garrett Crochet, we know what Garrett Crochet is capable of now as a starting pitcher, so shutting him down makes sense. What you want to see is you want to see, do you have anything coming up in the minors that's going to count? That's what I was going to say. Grayson Rodriguez. Yeah. They did that for the Orioles. Exactly. And they were like, hey, he's going to pitch like every week, not every five days. He's going to pitch every eight days. Once a week, he's going to start. Right. He's still on a heavy pitch count. And, And yeah, and you want to limit, you want to still keep his innings going. Because you do want to set these career highs, and you want to show, you want to stretch him out to, to a point where he's going to be able to, to go next year, and and pitch a full load, but you don't necessarily need him to go out and prove himself. Like I'm really actually not worried that he gave up all these runs tonight, because quite frankly, honestly, I, I don't need him to finish the season with a sparkling ERA or among the league leaders in strikeouts to be convinced that he's got the arm talent and the skills to be a viable number one starter whether for the White Sox or somebody else. And I, and I think that's going to be true around the league, too. I don't think a, a bad start in August or September for a guy who's never pitched more than 70 innings in a, in a season is going to be the type of thing that, that if the Yankees come calling or the Orioles come calling or whoever wants him, that they're going to look at that and go, well, but look at the way he faded in September. Now, if Eric Fetty were still on the team and he faded in September, you could sit there and go, he was a KBO flash in the pan. Right. That's what you would do. 
He had a bad start, his first start out there in St. Louis, although I think he's going to pitch really well down the stretch for him. I think that yeah. Michael Kopech is going to look amazing in the postseason in of the course sixth he inning. Is. And Aloy Jimenez, if he can stay healthy, may hit a bomb. And what's amazing with Aloy is the Orioles did exactly what the Marlins did with Tim Anderson. They said, this is what you are, and he listened. Yeah. I don't understand why this team can never make a player listen. Like, Tim Anderson didn't want to hit anywhere except for the top of the order. Goes to the Marlins, they're like, you don't hit here. Now he's not even in baseball. Right. Aloy Jimenez thinks he's an outfielder. The Orioles are like, not only are you not an outfielder, you're platooning with this guy over here. Right. Right? And, but you're seeing success. The problem is the White Sox always build up their players, tell you this guy's a star, if only he stays healthy forever, and then all of a sudden he makes this ridiculous progression that we haven't seen yet, we're going to win a World Series. And other teams look at our talent without the rosy colored glasses and then they actually use them in a way that actually benefits the team there's i I was thinking about you know your your interview with cbs too okay and and starting at my 17 seconds your 17 seconds of of tv fame yeah and and i was saying something really good at one point he was just talking over me while i was waving my hands on the screen (laughs) i was making a great point and he was like, Chris Lanudia, Sox in the basement, had a lot to say. And you see me on the screen waving my hands. I'm probably making an amazing point at that moment. And he just talked right over it, Ed. Talked right over it. I have no idea what that's like. Um, but uh, starting at the top, there, there's, a, there's a, a lack of respect all the way through this organization, okay? And it's, it's not necessarily that they are disrespectful to the fans or disrespectful to their players, but it's misplaced respect. They think pumping up a player's ego by saying that this guy is really good and we think that he is a budding star is respecting that player's talent. They think that talking, for example, about Tony La Russa's Hall of Fame credentials as opposed to what Tony La Russa was when he was rehired as the manager is putting respect on Tony La Russa's name. There's a certain aspect of it that it is, but it stems from the top, and, and what Jerry Reinsdorf does is he walks around demanding respect, okay? He wants fans to respect him for his business acumen, for who he is as a guy that, that happened to own the Bulls and get lucky to get Michael Jordan, that, that won a World Series for the White Sox, even though it was really a, a, a lightning in a bottle thing, and we've seen that. He thinks that we should respect what he does with the ballpark, the campfire milkshakes, the the amp, you know, the fireworks, carrying on these traditions, the giveaways. What he forgets is that we're here to be entertained, right? So he doesn't respect the fan base because they forget they're in entertainment. So they talk a good game. They will always tell us these players are going to entertain you. These players are going to be great. We're going to win. We're going to win World Series. And what they really should be doing is just sitting there saying, we think Aloy Jimenez is fun, and we want you to get to know Aloy Jimenez. Remember, Aloy Jimenez came up. Hi, Mom. You know, he's standing there making faces at Luis Robert Jr. He was our favorite player. But that doesn't work for Sox fans. See, but, that's but the it, thing. We're, it, it we're, not, can. we're not every fan base. I'm sorry. You always say this like, well, we'll just make it fun. I think that the vast majority of White Sox fans want to win. They don't give a crap if you're fun or not. They don't care if you're if – you're, if you're a great guy or you give the charity or you get along but, great but the clubhouse the or your your wife is like this wonderful person who walks around and hands out candy to the kids before the games. They want to win. Sox fans want to win. We are, we're but, just a different – we're cut from a different cloth. But here's the thing. If you keep telling Aloy Jimenez – you're a superstar. Well, yeah, and then you're going to poison him. Then you're going to poison him, and yeah. he's not fun, and he's not out there playing the game the way Aloy Jimenez can play the game. Yeah. That spooked me a little bit because he had the siren right as he passed us. But Can you tell I'm the son of a cop? Yeah. Didn't bother me didn't at all. Didn't bother you at all. Didn't I even dropped. flinch. I might be the son of a criminal. Who knows? Yeah. I went to I, my my house when I grew up was a block away from a from a fire station. Oh, same here. And the air, and the planes from Midway landed over my house. I had the planes that from O'Hare. Nothing. So, yeah, that's just, nothing. Keep going. Um, I just uh, apparently I was I was I was not cop friendly in my youth and, and it's carried over. But here's the thing, Aloy Jimenez when he came up and he was fun Aloy Jimenez when he was allowed to play Aloy Jimenez's game before he died and they put his jersey in the dugout. Yeah, right. He is a guy that has a high ceiling. We don't know what he can be, but he's out there. He's loose. He's swinging the pitches. He's doing what made him a viable major leaguer. Luis Robert Jr. 
before he's anointed as 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 generational talent before he's told you have to be the star of this team you've got to carry this moribund franchise that doesn't surround you with much talent to the promised land you can't tell me that that doesn't weigh on a Luis robert jr the white Sox do too much trying to tell us what these guys are before we see what they are before, before they we, become what before they are they are even allowed to exactly. become what they are exactly Listen. so it, it that's where the respect the lack of respect for everybody comes into play before we get to the end of this show yeah you got to do the uh, village of lamont i don't remember that one i'm not good at it. want yeah. to experience it downtown with real heats incredible something or other Great food. Come on, you've got it right there. Wide your phone, open. Just read it for crying out loud. Great food, wide open green spaces. I'm sitting out here on the patio at Gordon Carey. I did a three hour live show with the 108. I'm surprised I'm doing this well at this point. You are doing phenomenal. Okay, I'm hanging in there. I'm even relying on you and I'm letting you talk because I don't have anything else to say. You've run out of things to right. say. Okay, go yeah, ahead, read yeah. it. Do you want to experience a downtown with real history, great eats and drinks, and green spaces filled with adventures? Visit the village of Lamont. Shop, dine, drink, explore. And see all they have to offer at LamontDowntown.com. I just needed to be set up for it. That's all I needed to do. <laughs> I just needed to remind you of how to have fun, Chris. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, again, I, it was really fun tonight to interact with fans. I think most fans just they still love this team. But I think every fan sees it as the owner. I think we've reached that point now right. where I would say years ago – you would get a pushback, like, oh, he helped us win a World Series, right? Like, remember what it was like before they won the World Series? Everybody hated Jerry. Right. Then Jerry won, and a certain group of people said, he ain't that bad. That's all gone. Exactly. Like, every single ounce of Jerry Reinsdorf love or excuses for him or, well, at least he got us one, is gone. It died this year. He is back to being a pariah in Chicago sports. He's back to being somebody that people, like, I mean, the biggest pops of the night in this crowd were shots at Jerry Reinsdorf. I don't think you could find anybody no. that is sitting around saying, oh, he's not that bad. Oh, he won six championships with the Bulls. Give him a break. Like, nobody's excusing that. Oh, you know, and, and even, even the World Series, like, people have now started to say, look, things fell right. But it wasn't because the owner invested in the team. They weren't the highest payroll in baseball. One of the points that I made on CBS News that got cut. Again, you're in a division where everybody else is a medium to small market team and you're the big market team. If you just spent an average amount of money for your market, you would win three out of every four years, four out of every five years. You'd be contending constantly, and people would be annoyed at the disadvantage that other teams have in the Central because the White Sox are at such an advantage, and he never took advantage of that. Which is the ridiculous part. You know, his his philosophy that, that he told David Sampson. Uh, come in second. Always come in second. Keep him wanting it. Here's, here's the thing that, that... Get him a campfire milkshake. Yeah. That part of it, we know that the cynical side of that and what Jerry really meant by that is flawed. But the reality is is that if you are capable of coming in second place every year, you're going to come in play first place sometimes. You're going to win a wild card sometimes. You're going to catch fire in the playoffs. As, as a fandom, we would get to win sometimes because you're at least within striking distance. The problem with always finishing fourth and third and fifth and then once every ten years coming in first you don't have a chance. We know when we don't have a chance come May, and that's why we start tuning out. Because what what are we what are we going to look forward to if we get to the end of April and you're like, well, hell, they're already 15 games under 500. They're not catching the Twins or the Guardians because they're not going to collapse that badly. What are we What are we left to do? We're left to sit there and go. I wonder if the campfire milkshake's any damn good. And as it turns out. It's not. Yeah. It's terrible. It's just uh, terrible. Yeah. This is better. Cheers. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always on socksinthebasement.com.